Welcome to Rad Quarters. Today we'll be talking about ultrasound of submandibular sialolithiasis, or salivary gland stones. I'm Dr. Dan Koval, and this episode is sponsored by Samsung Ultrasound. The fabulous images in this presentation were obtained on a Samsung RS85 Prestige ultrasound unit. I'm going to show you the ultrasound appearance of submandibular sialolithiasis, and I'll review the details of floor of mouth anatomy. Right, the submandibular glands are paired salivary glands that are located inferior to the body of the mandible. So here we're looking at a coronal CT scan of a patient's face and neck region. There we see the mandible, and just below that we see the paired submandibular glands. The largest salivary glands are the parotid glands followed by the submandibular gland, which are larger than the sublingual glands. So you can see the submandibular is in the middle for size. Unlike the parotid glands, the submandibular glands do not contain lymph nodes. And a duct extends from the submandibular gland, also known as Wharton's duct, traveling from the gland hilum superiorly to open up the floor of the mouth on either side of the base of the frenulum of the tongue. And we don't typically see this on ultrasound unless it's abnormally dilated, so stay tuned. On ultrasound, the submandibular glands will normally appear as encapsulated structures with homogeneous echotexture, similar to the parotid gland. There may be fine linear echo densities within these structures corresponding to intraglandular ductules, and it's normal to see some intravascular flow in color Doppler imaging. On grayscale imaging, you may confuse these with dilated ducts, these physiologic vessels, but you can easily assess that by adding color Doppler, and they should normally fill in. Like the parotid gland, there are superficial and deep portions. The superficial aspect is more almond-shaped, whereas the deeper portion has more of a triangular configuration. And some adjacent landmarks to be aware of include the mandible, which we can see here on this transverse image, and then the mylohyoid muscle there. So you can see the gland will be located between the mandible and the mylohyoid. And I'll go into this anatomy in more detail shortly. All right, so let's look at our case. This was a male patient presenting with a left neck mass that enlarged and became more painful with eating. And here we're looking at a transverse view at the left floor of the mouth. So there's that mandible again and the mylohyoid. Here we also see the geniohyoid muscle, which is a floor of the mouth muscle that we can see well in ultrasound. And do you notice anything else here that may be accounting for the patient's symptoms? Well, we see this echogenic shadowing focus here at the left floor of mouth with some surrounding sliver of anechoic fluid. And when we turn on long axis, we can see that that fluid corresponds to a dilated duct leading up to this obstructing stone, a 0.8 centimeter calculus at the floor of the mouth. If we continue to follow that duct back, you can see it starts to branch here in this glandular structure, which represents the submandibular gland. And there's that mylohyoid muscle for reference. So this is an example of a submandibular duct stone that's obstructing and clinically symptomatic. On real-time imaging of this long axis view, you can nicely see the stone here at the distal aspect of the dilated duct within the floor of the mouth. Let's travel backwards towards the gland. You can see there's the duct coming in. And then there we see it branching within the gland, and these are dilated intraglandular ducts. The gland itself is also heterogeneous and enlarged. On transverse view of real-time imaging, we see similar findings. Here again, the landmarks, we see the mylohyoid muscle, and then the mandible, so the submandibular gland is between those structures. And then at the floor of the mouth, we see this dilated duct here, leading right to the stone, this obstructing stone there. And the CT correlate here, this is an axial CT image showing the stone here at the left floor of mouth. Here's the mandible. And if we look at the sagittal correlate for this sagittal ultrasound image, we see the stone here. We don't see the dilated duct quite as well, but it's more visible on ultrasound. So a nice example of submandibular sialolithiasis. So sialolithiasis is salivary calculus disease. And we see that most commonly in the submandibular gland. And that's for a few reasons. One is that the submandibular gland secretes a more viscous alkaline saliva that promotes stone formation. And the submandibular duct is a long duct that drains somewhat vertically uphill, so we get increased stasis. So when this duct becomes acutely obstructed, the gland can become enlarged. That's known as sialadenitis because it's enlarged and inflamed. And the duct proximal to the stone will be dilated. These will clinically present with colicky pain, most pronounced around times of eating. And ultrasound is great at detecting radiolucent stones, but small stones less than 2 millimeters may not shadow. Now let's go into a bit more detail with the floor of mouth anatomy because we can see that quite well in ultrasound and it can really help you to make the diagnosis correctly if you understand the anatomy. So we're returning to our coronal CT image here showing the submandibular glands. Now if we stay in the same plane and move a bit more anteriorly, we have this view showing a nice example of normal floor of mouth anatomic landmarks. So here we have the mandible again, 
There's the mylohyoid muscle, and you can see it's somewhat like a sling or a hammock at the floor of the mouth here. We have the geniohyoid muscle here, a floor of the mouth muscle. And then just superior to that, we have these paired genioglossus muscles. And finally, below or inferior to the mylohyoid, we have these anterior belly of the digastric muscles. And we can also see some submental lymph nodes below that area here. Now, if we put a transducer and transverse plane right here on ultrasound, just under the patient's chin, the image will look similar to this. So here we're at the same level and we nicely see the same anatomy. So there are those anterior digastric muscles corresponding to these regions. There we have that mylohyoid sling traveling between both aspects of the mandible there. We can see that geniohyoid muscle here corresponding to the muscle at the midline floor of mouth. Posterior to that, we have the genioglossus muscle. And then we can even see the sublingual glands on this image. So those will be located within the sublingual spaces. In addition to the sublingual space, we also have the submandibular space. And you may notice that these two spaces are divided by that mylohyoid musculature, which is an inferior sling. And notice that the submandibular space will be below or inferior lateral to that mylohyoid, whereas the sublingual space is above or superior medial to it. Now the submandibular space contains the submandibular glands, lymph nodes, and the anterior belly of the digastric muscles, whereas the sublingual space will contain sublingual glands, submandibular duct, and the anterior aspect of the hyoglossus muscle. We haven't talked about that muscle yet, but it's important because the submandibular duct will travel between the hyoglossus and the mylohyoid muscles and could be a useful landmark for finding it on ultrasound. So I'm not just reviewing this anatomy to torture you, there's a reason. <laughs> So if we return to our transverse view of the floor of the mouth here on ultrasound, we're moved a bit more posteriorly, but we're still transverse. And then we can again see that mylohyoid sling here. There's the geniohyoid muscle at midline. And then we see this new structure, that's the hyoglossus muscle. So this space here between the mylohyoid and the hyoglossus is the part of the sublingual space where the submandibular duct will travel. In this case, we don't see a dilated duct because this is a normal patient. On real-time imaging, moving anterior to posterior and transverse view, we can really nicely see this anatomy. So again, there are the anterior belly of the digastric muscles. There's that mylohyoid sling. Posterior to that, we have the geniohyoid muscle. And then behind that, we have the genioglossus muscle. Both of these are at midline. We can even see the sublingual glands here bilaterally. There it is a bit better on the left side there. These anechoic tubular structures are not ducts here. These are the physiologic lingual vessels that are frequently seen at the base of the floor of the mouth. You can differentiate that by, again, adding color Doppler. And as we go posteriorly, there we can see there's the right hyoglossus, the left hyoglossus we can see here. And between those spaces, between the mylohyoid and the hyoglossus, that's the, where the submandibular duct will live. And again, it's normal. We don't see it in this case because there's no ductal obstruction. All right, now that you're all masters of floor of mouth sonographic anatomy, let's return briefly to that submandibular duct stone cine clip here. Again, we're left transverse. So here's the mylohyoid muscle. There's the geniohyoid. There's the mandible. And we're seeing part of the anterior belly of the digastric muscle here. As we sweep posteriorly, then the submandibular gland comes into view. Here's the submandibular gland here. Again, mylohyoid, there's part of the mandible there, so it's located between those structures. It can be hard to see the submandibular duct on this view, but if you start by looking at the floor of the mouth here, again, using that hyoglossus as a landmark, there's that hyoglossus here, there's the mylohyoid. So between those two, we see that dilated duct. And as I sweep back and forth, you can see there's the stone. And then very nicely, again, notice that hyoglossus, a great landmark to find that submandibular duct in the sublingual space. The duct itself is located medial to the sublingual gland, which is also in that sublingual space. All right, thank you so much for joining me, and I really hope you found this educational. Thank you to our sponsor, Samsung Ultrasound. If you like this lecture, a great way to support us is to subscribe to the video podcast on Apple or Spotify, or by clicking the YouTube subscribe button. To see bonus teaching material posted throughout the week, you can follow us on social media, links are in the show notes, or you can click the YouTube community tab. Until next time, radiology is life.